Claire, a warm welcome to our event tonight. It's so good to have you here to deliver this presentation. Thank you for having me. And thank you for this Second Life uh, venue. It's very exciting. Oh, it's great, isn't it? C can I just say a couple of things about the venue so that people know, and then we can go into the presentation? Is that all right? Mm, of course. Let's do that. So... Um, hopefully on screen just now you can see my avatar in Second Life and my lips are moving. So my name in Second Life is Jack Leeson. Um, many moons ago, not long after Second Life started, you couldn't pick your um, real life name. Oh, now I'm trying to spin on the screen and it's not working at all. <laughs> I'm just going to turn my avatar around so people can see the venue that Claire and I are in tonight. And you can see there are a couple of people with us. Um, Second Life is an online virtual environment where lots of things happen, um, also including um, counselling events and conferences. And back in September, Claire delivered an excellent lecture, Counselling Class and Income. Um, unfortunately, our technology failed and we didn't manage to capture that presentation. So Claire very generously said that she would do the presentation again with us today and give us an opportunity for some question and answer. So we're really excited about that. One of the things that we've got going is what we what is called the chat bridge. So whatever you type into a chat room, Claire and her avatar here in Second Life can see the chat um, and so you can bridge the two worlds. So Claire's going to deliver her presentation. There'll be PowerPoint slides, all the things that you get a usual conference venue, except we're in a virtual environment. Um, and then following the lecture, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A. Um, we're going to take about 10 minutes for a coffee, I think. Claire, you nearly lost your coffee. And then yes. we'll come back to Claire for some question and answer. Um, so yeah, we don't need to do anything about toilets or fire escapes in this virtual venue, so we're all good for that. Um, all that remains is for me to introduce you, Claire. Um, so w we met through your blog and through online events and, you know, I've always been very impressed and inspired, Claire, um, by the way that you, as a therapist, you take us as a therapeutic community out of our comfort zone and help us to look at maybe some of our prejudices, maybe the places that we might be discriminating and we don't realise, you know, some of those um, really unhelpful blind spots. So I really appreciate that you take us to those places and I guess you're probably going to do that tonight and I really welcome that and I'm sure the audience do too. So. We look forward to your you. presentation, um, Counselling, Class and Income. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, John. So what I propose to do this evening is a bit of a dull talk. There will be slides. Um, at some point I will fall off the stage, no doubt. Just ignore that. The talk will last about 30 minutes. I can see Chatbridge here, but I'm going to try and ignore it because it can be quite distracting. I'm going to trust uh, John and Saz. If there's something uh, that is really provoking you in the chat room, I'm going to trust them to ask me to stop and take a question. If I don't get any questions, and I'm really up for questions or comments or anything that you want to say, then I'll go to the end uh, of uh, that section. And then I think if you're up for it, just have a very quick session so that we can sort of ground in what I've said rather than everybody just rushing off. Then we can rush off and just have a bit of a stretch and then please do come back. What I'm really interested in is discussion and debate about this because as far as I'm aware there's not a lot of debate about this and so I'm really open to uh, having new points of view uh, sent my way. So what I'm going to do now is just begin and uh, plow on through. Okay to go John? Good to go on my end, yes. Just give me a shout when you want your first slide clear and I'll put that up for Will you. Will do. Thank you. Why don't you put the first slide up now because it takes a little while to load. 
Okay, so counsellors are expected to be reflective and reflexive about our work. We're expected to reconsider our thoughts and feelings about our clients, ourselves, and the relationship that develops between us. We're given a vocabulary and specialised tools in which to flame, re frame reflexivity, which has undoubtedly helped them and can also serve as all specialised language can to obfuscate true meanings even from ourselves. This is especially likely when thinking about working with people who are on state benefits or working and very poor. A search of the counselling literature shows that there is a paucity of research or even commentary on what has become known as the underclass, itself a derogatory term, rather like calling gay men confirmed bachelors. This is in contrast to other people-related disciplines or even politics where the data and research is rich and informative. The socio-economic boundaries around counselling mean that counsellors are only ever likely to encounter people on benefits as clients rather than as peers. It means that teaching about class where it is rarely attempted is purely theoretical. Although there are proportionately few non-white counsellors, non-white counsellors exist and can speak directly to the experience. The same can be said for gay, lesbian and transgender counsellors, counsellors who have experienced child abuse, domestic violence or drug and al alcohol abuse. Those people who have had the experience of long-term poverty remain unrepresented and thus unheard. I hope that if this talk doesn't directly alter some of the commonly held opinions about the poor, it will add to the complexity of the so far very limited debate on how best to understand and work with an enduring experience of poverty. I don't aim to be an apologist for every person who is living in poverty, since every individual will have an intricate and complex multifaceted existence. There are, however, important parts of the life of a person who lives with poverty that have a direct effect on physical and physiological well-being, our view of ourselves, our view of others. Having insight into some of these aspects will, I hope, offer food for thought and more conscious ways of working with people who are poor. A brief history of poverty. Historically, social responses to poverty tend to fall into two groups relief of beggars and paupers, or a profound distrust and fear of the poor. Elizabeth I was the first lawmaker to recognise the, the need for poverty to be addressed by society rather than by individuals. Prior to this, individuals who felt moved to help their neighbours did so, but there was no obligation to. The church, mainly through convents, abbeys and other religious houses, offered shelter, food and at times work for the destitute, but the Reformation broke this chain of support. In 1563, the first poor laws were introduced, which recognised for the first time that poor people were part of a community, and that the community, in the form of the parish, must help support them. The system was funded by taxation, and each parish was required to provide employment. The poor were categorised into the deserving poor, infants, the very elderly, the very infirm, and families who had temporarily fallen on difficult times, the undeserving poor, who were considered a threat to society, beggars, travellers, migrant workers, the deserving unemployed, people who were able to work but unable to find employment. It didn't take long for the deserving unemployed to join the undeserving poor. Can you change the slide please, John? It's worth noting the political and social circumstances that preceded these laws. More people were simply remaining alive and there was less food. The Enclosures Act devastated the peasant farming tradition as private landowners found it more profitable to have sheep on their land rather than people, or to increase their personal area of farmland and decrease the number of individuals working on it. Prior to the Enclosures Act, individual family groups grew their own food in what we might call a small holding. Now they were simply turned out of their homes and made vacant. Those that didn't die of starvation or illness came to the city. The numbers of the very poor, the very weak, potential carriers of disease, and the very angry increased, and it was the fear of civil unrest that caused the poor laws to come into being, rather than any inherent concern for the individual's welfare. Laws altered over time, becoming more or less penalising. Beggars could be whipped and have their earlobes burned through, be imprisoned and executed. They were returned to their own parishes, limiting where they could live. 
Houses of correction, established prior to Elizabeth I and continued well after, were variously places where the poor were punished or rehabilitated. Whatever the case, poverty is perceived as a fault that requires correction. So let's talk about the external locus of evaluation. 